Um, next one up that we've got is a game that again, you know, we're feeling really good about ourselves because we we called this Georgia Florida game before it even happened. We said it was probably going to be a slog fest and Florida was going to win and it wasn't going to be that interesting. And for a game that is interesting every single year, this was really like I, I thought in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, I said all that about this game, but I'm going to sit down and watch it and it's going to be awesome. You know what? It wasn't awesome. It's amazing that Florida scored 24 points in this game when you look at the stats. Like, it's astonishing. Florida only had 231 yards of offense. It's just Yikes. Georgia only had 164, right? I mean, it's just 5.2 per pass for Florida, 2.1 yards per carry, 4.3 yards per pass for Georgia, and 1.1 per carry. It's just ugly, ugly, ugly game. And the fact that you know, Georgia didn't, fumble the ball they didn't throw any interceptions and they lose by 14 points it, it's almost baffling that that could happen um but you know like we said anytime the scores get this low and the averages get this low you start getting some really strange results uh just because of the i mean the weirdness of it all georgia was four of 14 on third down and over two on fourth down um uh, with eight total first downs and what was just astonishing to me was their play calling in this game especially in the first half where i think i think at one point georgia had eight eight pass attempts and six of them were on third and at least six um which tells you their game plan going into it and throughout the game was run up the middle two times and then put it on your freshman quarterback who's got zero offensive line to somehow magically complete something in a third and six, seven, eight situation. And what we learned from that was it was a horrible game plan. And here's the thing. If you're Georgia and you're four and three coming into this game and you've had some ugly losses already, why don't you come out with something – I mean – try something throw it 50 times just to see what happens i know that sounds stupid in the sec but against this defense but do something besides show up roll over and take a loss you know so what if you go out there and you lose 30 to 7 you know who cares at least you try to do something besides the thing that you knew wouldn't work going into this florida's not given up you know two, 300 yards when you're running off tackle up the middle with a crappy offensive line. Do something different. Am I wrong? Am I crazy? No. Um, no. I mean, it's interesting, the game plan, right? Because Florida ran it about twice as often as they passed. Georgia passed about twice as often as they ran. Nick Chubb was the leading rusher. He didn't even get 10 carries. He only had nine. Sonny Michelle only had three carries in the ball game, right? Now, I will, you know, in, in their defense, nothing was They working. only, look at how many plays they ran, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, they only ran 52. <laughs> they only ran 52 <laughs> plays. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's nuts, right? I mean, Florida ran a fairly normal 73. Even that's low. But Georgia only managed 52 offensive plays in the ballgame, all of which were generally almost completely ineffective. So, you know, I, I'm going to take it back because – there, I, you know, I missed a fumble, and I, I guess I, I'm reading off box scores, and apparently ESPN's is, is just wrong in this instance because Georgia did fumble uh, early in the game. I think they fumbled on their, what, uh, own five-yard line, something like that, or it was a punt. Uh, no, yeah, okay, okay, you know what, I'm reading this wrong, and that's that's why this is all screwy. But, you know, Georgia, Georgia lost this game because they couldn't win field position. You know, Callaway returned a punt. Uh, way down the field to the Georgia 39 yard line. Let me, you know what? Let me just walk you through for, for all the listeners here where Florida starting field position was in, in their touchdown drives. First touchdown to go up seven to three. They started on the Georgia 39 after a punt return. Second score to go up 14, 10. They started on the Georgia 44 out of a, after a shanked punt. Okay. So that's 14, 10 ball game. Third score to go up 21-10. They started on the Florida 44 uh, after, a uh, again, another 30-yard punt by Georgia. And then their final score, 24, uh, they started on the Georgia 47. So three of their scoring drives started in Georgia territory. 
and the third was only on the Florida 47 yard line. So yeah, I mean that's how you you win 24 to 10 with a team that can't hardly move the ball is Georgia just played atrocious field position offense and you know the punter was really really spotty, special teams was spotty, but like he said, it was just three and out, three and out, three and out, and they they gave up enough field position over time, and it would it would be like four or five drives, and they'd very sneakily lose five yards to drive until Florida just had to go you know forty yards to score, uh, and, and that's and then that's how they ended up losing. So the I think the the perception has been that when Luke when Luke Del Rio was in to start the season. And when he came back after injury, um, he's really lifted this team and elevated this team. But I can't say, looking at any of his performances, that that's actually the case. I think it's more a function of who they played than how well they're, what kind of play they're getting at quarterback. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think he adds adds a fair amount to the team. I, I don't know that it's completely fair. I wouldn't call him good, <laughs> frankly, um, but he puts them in decent enough situations where they can compete. I mean, he, he was actually pretty rough in this game, honestly. Right. I mean, he, he really wasn't great and I get that, but you know, with Appleby, there were times like that Tennessee game. I mean, Appleby just curled into a shell in that Tennessee ball game. He really did. And we haven't really seen that from Del Rio. I mean, his stats aren't great and you can look at them. And they, like you say, they really just varied with the opponent. And and he also really hadn't played anybody. I mean, he missed Tennessee and Vanderbilt, and Appleby played those two teams. The only guys Del Rio has played is UMass, Kentucky, North Texas, and Missouri, and now Georgia. But, you know, I, I think the thing to me is, even though Appleby, you know, had some pretty decent stats in the Tennessee game, when it mattered and when there was pressure, he couldn't really deliver the football and run the offense. And... With Del Rio, I, I feel like they're actually at least managing to get the ball to the check down or operate the offense in a somewhat consistent manner. Fair enough. Um, so I don't see from a running game standpoint much from Florida, and we've already talked about how poorly Georgia has run the ball this year. I think Jacob Eason is getting a little bit of unfair treatment because – you've got a true freshman quarterback playing behind an absolutely atrocious offensive line. So on Florida's side of the ball, I'm not sure that I'm real confident in them being able to score points when they have to. Same thing with Georgia, but I think it's a little different situation. I think the expectations are a little bit different. But looking at Florida's schedule, so and and I want to. I know I said I'm only going to do one rant this week, but I'm about to do another one. Yeah, um, I knew that wouldn't be true, but go ahead. <laughs> Florida six and one, um, and then the schedule remaining is at Arkansas versus South Carolina. Presbyterian was canceled, so then LSU and Florida State. Kind of like we talked about with LSU last week, the back end of their schedule is where all the teams with the pulse are. And there's a strong case at 6-1 and one that they're going to play. they got four games left on their schedule. Three of those aren't a given. Right, and that's that's saying South Carolina is a given, which it may not be. I think they'll beat Arkansas, but it's not a given 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 how bad Florida can score. So, which leads me to the fact that, or to the point that we're SEC fans here. We love all our teams, but we also keep it real. And Florida's got no business in the top ten. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But if we're gonna call out the voters for voting a Notre Dame too high or a team that beat Notre Dame too high. Uh, Florida at 10 is absolutely ridiculous when the only top 75 team they've played scored 38 straight on them and beat the crap out of them. Is that fair to say? I think it is. I mean, they've only played one ranked game. That was Tennessee. They lost that game in what I think they would almost – yeah, I think most of them are basically masochists at this point, having had to suffer through the Will Muschamp era. But I think they would admit that game was a disaster, right? So that's that's the only ranked team they've played. And to have them 10th uh, is, I mean, it's silly. It, it, but it goes back to, I think, the pollsters tend to rank you and say, well, 
they just, it's almost like they assume you want you're going to win all your games until you lose them sometimes. And I don't know. I, I don't I don't know the logic. I mean, if if you have that same logic, then you just pick the team with the toughest schedule number one because they're going to beat the most teams. Uh, in this case, I don't see how you expect Florida to come out of anything uh, the next four games with much better than a two and two record, and it could be worse than that. Um, and if they finish the season eight and three, I mean, they're they're not going to be a top ten team. And if they, if we're assuming, because right now, given how the two teams are playing, I am assuming that LSU is going to win that game, which puts Florida at four and two uh, in the conference with two conference games left, Arkansas and South Carolina. If they drop one of those games, Kentucky has a very, very strong argument for win in the east so that's that's a discussion for another day but it does seem ridiculous to me that a team's best win is a kentucky a win over kentucky and they're in the top 10 going into week 10 i i just it's lazy voting it's looking at the name florida in six and one and putting them in the top 10 which Florida got Notre Dame last year in their bowl game. They were overrated because of the schedule they played, and they played a good Michigan team that they had no business being in a bowl against anyway. So uh, I, I'm, I'm really tired of it. Nothing's going to change. And thankfully, the playoff committee doesn't seem to, to have the same standard. So um, Georgia, from here on out, I don't know what to expect. I think we had unfair expectations for this team coming into the season, given what we're seeing in Miami. Um, I think both of those fan bases had unreasonable expectations. Um, and, and you've said time and time again throughout this this season that Georgia hasn't recruited well in the offensive line. They have some holes, and they're weighted weird where their talent is good and not good. Um, but talk about that a little bit in terms of new coach, excited fan base, expectations versus reality, and how – Kirby goes about kind of winning back the favor for the, from the fans. Right. You know, it, it it was a frustrating thing to watch in the Rick era that they never really seemed to put together too many teams where they had good talent at skill positions and talent on the lines at the same time. Maybe the 2012 team fell in that category, but honestly, the 2012 team really peaked when they played in the SEC championship game. Before that, you have to go back to the, you know, the Georgia team that kind of got snubbed because they, you know, kind of knocked themselves out of the championship hunt, uh, you know, way, way back when. But, yeah, I mean, this it's the story of the Rick era. You, know, you can talk about a lot of things with Rick and what he did right and what he did wrong, but his greatest failing was always consistently having effective players on in the trenches. I mean, that was, that was what he couldn't do. If he had the couple times that he actually managed to field good offensive lines, his teams looked really, really good. But most of the time, they really weren't competent. Last year, I mean, they finally had another line that was actually, you know, solid. And then the quarterback play was absolutely atrocious. But what I will say in Kirby Smart's defense is you can talk about coaching. You can talk about scheme, about decisions making their game. I don't care what it is. If your offensive line can't get Nick Chubb more than 2.2 yards per carry, you ain't going to win the football game. And I don't care what you say about the coach. If your offensive line's that bad, it has to do with the players and the way they've been coached up. Because it takes years to coach offensive linemen, at least a couple years. You you don't you're not going to turn them around uh, just walking in spring practice and, and fall camp and have have great players. It takes years to to take young kids at 18 years old and bulk them up, build them up, put them in a weight room, and then usually you want to play third, fourth year players because. This is a big difference between an 18 year old kid and a 20 and 21 year old kid physically and the amount of time. Not, it's not just strength and conditioning. It's just growth. They get bigger. They get stronger. Um, and Kirby Smart really inherited a mess there. And, and you focus on the offensive line. But, you know, the front seven has the same issue. They've lost a tremendous amount of talent from where they were at last year. They're extremely young. I talked about in the preview that Georgia's is really a year away from being pretty good. Florida is really in the same boat. Both these teams, um, they've got a lot of young players at positions where you don't want youth, particularly in the trenches and the front sevens. And for all the talent they have, like like you said a second ago, they've got weird stuff. Like they'll have, you know, 
Georgia has a five star, you know, big top five star player. Who is he? Well, he's the true freshman quarterback. Um, you know, if you had a five star junior or senior quarterback, it'd mean a hell of a lot more. But when he's only a true freshman, that five star doesn't get you very far. Similarly, they have, you know, a five star tailback that can't get anywhere because they don't have any holes. And they have a actually have a bunch of star talent in running back. Uh, but they don't have any talent at offensive tackle in particular. And they got a great tight end. But if you have no receivers to complement the tight end, what does that matter? Uh, you can see that Terry Godwin's a five star. I mean, you, and we can keep rolling down this list. And, you know, they defensively have got some guys like Lorenzo Carter, but Carter's kind of a tweener. And they don't have the solid, you know, middle linebackers. They don't have a Beckwith. They don't have, you know, a Reuben Foster. And it's just glaring uh, where where they have players. They tend to be tweeners and role players, and they don't have this, you know, the offensive tackles, the offensive guards, defensive ends that it takes to just man up and win a football game. And if you don't have those pieces, everything else falls apart. And I will say, you know, you know, we I kind of talked about this before, but I've never been a huge Mark Rick fan because if you go back and look at his stats, we talked about this early in the season, right? He's got like a fourteen percent win percentage. Uh, when he's playing, you know, highly ranked teams. And there was a lot of talk early in the season of, you know, especially in the media, how stupid Georgia was for getting rid of their coach. Great winner. I want you to go back and look at where Miami is actually at now that they're having to play real teams. And it ain't, and it ain't pretty. So uh, I, you know, I caution any Georgia fans that feel like you've made a horrible mistake. Uh, yeah. You're, Kirby Smart's probably doing a better job with Georgia than Mark Richt is right now in Miami because that loss to Notre Dame is almost inexcusable. And one thing I'll say in terms of their personnel, I think, and maybe this is more eye test than actual statistics will show, but I think Georgia's defense, especially given the offensive struggles they've had and the short fields they've been handed, I think Georgia's defense has actually outplayed maybe their talent level in terms of actual talent and seniority that they have. And on the flip side, I think their offense is probably underperformed, even though they have a, a freshman quarterback. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, you know, we'll get into this in a couple of weeks, but one of the most underrated parts of Georgia right now, and that everything somebody's, I think everybody's overlooking this with Kirby Smart. It's the fourth best rush defense in the SEC. They're right behind Florida. Now they've given up a ton of touchdowns, 12 touchdowns, which is way higher. You know, it's like bottom half of the conference, right? But yards per play, they're only giving up 3.2 yards per carry. And that's pretty impressive. So, and that's not just, I should say it's 3.26 when you talk about uh, FBS teams. It's not like this really weighted unfairly. So they're right up there with Florida and LSU in terms of run defenses. And I'll tell you right now, that is something to keep an eye on when Auburn and Georgia play in a few weeks, because that's, that's going to be a real test for Auburn. 